Thank you for starting your week with us. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Lee Ji-yoon in Seoul. Let's get started with a glimpse of today's highlights. What changes are ahead as the new administration reviews the performance-based pay system pushed through under the past government? The Moon Jae-in government is looking to provide additional compensation to firms that operated in the now-shuttered Kaesong Industrial Complex. These stories are more coming right up. After a sharp rally last week, the Korean equity market showed a somewhat sluggish picture on the first session of the week. However, the Kospi did manage to touch new highs in intraday trading. We're now joined by markets contributor Choi jin Suk to talk about overall stock market performance and upcoming market events. Hello, jin Suk. Thanks for having me. All right, so how did the Korean stock market close on the first day of the week? Both the Kospi and the Kostak market didn't move much in the first session of the week. The Kospi was mostly flat, falling by 0.1% to close at 2352.97, while the Kostak fell by 0.4% to close at 642. The Kospi opened the session with a slight uptick, raising expectations for another record high. On the Kospi market, most blue chip stocks performed strongly to once lift the index above 2370 for the first time ever. In particular, SK Hynix, the second largest stock by market cap, rose sharply to break its 52-week high due to expectations for rising DRAM prices. However, the market lost steam in late hours as institutions unloaded lots of shares. Although foreign investors didn't buy uh, shares on the Kospi uh, market aggressively during today's session, they have recently been expanding their exposure to the Korean equity market a lot. Korea Exchange said today offshore investors bought a net 5.59 billion US dollars worth of Korean stocks between January and April, the third largest among Asian nations after India and Taiwan. During the first four months of 2017, the benchmark Kospi index shot up 14.35%, becoming the best performer in the region as well. Then, what are some of the market events lined up for this week? I mean, more attention is expected to be on indicators it's coming especially from the United States. That's right. The U.S. equity market last week uh, broke its all-time high as major retailers helped lift sentiment with robust earnings. Global investors are now eager to see more conviction in the market about recovery in the world's largest economy through data this week. The list includes a personal income and spending reported on Tuesday local time, auto sales, ADP job gains and manufacturing ISM index on Thursday, and most importantly, the employment report on Friday. Experts expect the U.S. labor market created around 185,000 jobs in May, which would further bolster the case for the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates in its upcoming FOMC meeting. The Fed will also release the base book on Wednesday to show economic conditions in various regions in the country. Now, I guess one of the reasons that we're seeing such heavy focus on economic indicators mm -hmm. coming from the United States is probably because the impact it might have on the Fed's monetary policy. Exactly. When it comes to future monetary policy decisions, the Fed has been closely monitoring two economic conditions, inflation and employment. Within the labor market, the Fed particularly focuses on wage growth because U.S. employees have been suffering from stagnant wage growth for a long time. Therefore, if personal income and wage growth data this week come out with a positive results, the Fed is more likely to raise interest rates in June. In that sense, global investors are expected to keep a close eye on Fed officials delivering speeches this week as well. The list includes San Francisco Fed President John Williams, Fed Governor Jerome Powell and Lyle Brainard, and Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan. One of the positive throughout the uh, global market is that the market seemed to be ready for another rate hike, followed by better economic data. CME Fed Watch, a futures market betting on future hikes, now sees a 84% possibility of a June hike. 
Also, better economic data here at home has been lifting sentiment among foreign investors who wants to invest in the Korean market as mm -hmm. well. So what are some of the indicators that they should pay attention to this week? Economic indicators at home have been showing improvements since uh, April, and this helped lift sentiment among foreign investors in the Korean market. In this regard, people might want to closely monitor Wednesday's data for industrial activities in particular, if the data shows robust capital expenditure, it may further raise expectations for further improvements in the Korean economy. Export and import numbers will be reported on Thursday as well. Experts project Korea's exports surged by more than 20% in May. If the data uh, continues its positive trend, it will give another boost to the Korean equity market going forward. So for now, it looks like there aren't that many negative catalysts mm -hmm. that might affect the global market. So, but what are some of the factors that could potentially turn that around? U.S. President Donald Trump recently wrapped up his overseas visit. Market experts are closely watching to see what he will do after his trip, specifically what comments he will post on his Twitter account. In this respect, uncertainty surrounding his alleged attempt to stop FBI investigations or his son-in-law Jared Kushner's suggested ties with Russia can serve as a negative market factor. When it comes to economic indicators, experts are concerned that G2 countries will show a sluggish picture in the manufacturing industry. America's ISM manufacturing index is expected to fall compared to the previous month and Standard Chartered projects the expansion of China's manufacturing sector might have slowed down in May. All right, thank you so much for that look today. Thank you. Over in Sicily, Italy, leaders of seven wealthy nations concluded their weekend summit with a commitment to fight protectionism, but with a wide divide on global climate change. On Saturday, U.S. President Donald Trump agreed to language in the final G7 communique to, quote, fight all forms of protectionism and commit to a rules-based international trade system, conceding that trade has not always worked to the benefit of everyone. Trump in the past had threatened to renegotiate NAFTA and impose unilateral tariffs on Mexican and Chinese goods. As he left Sicily, he tweeted he had great meetings on everything, highlighting the section on trade, which called for the removal of all, quote, trade distorting practices. He was opposed by his G6 counterparts on climate change, however, who are reportedly frustrated by Trump's reluctance to honor the legally binding 2015 Paris Agreement on climate change. Trump tweeted he will think it over and announce his decision by next week. The Moon Jae-in government has said it will submit its supplementary budget proposal to the National Assembly by next week as it pushes forward its new job creation platform. It said the goal is to submit the proposal by June 7th, next Wednesday, as the ruling party hopes to win approval for the plan by the end of the month. But it remains to be seen whether it will be able to convince rival parties to greenlight the extra budget within that time frame, as the latter has insisted it will make sure the budget satisfy all legal requirements. The finance ministry had earlier this month committed to creating jobs through aggressive fiscal stimulus, including a supplementary budget. During campaigning, Moon had promised a 10 trillion won extra budget to help support new jobs in the public sector beginning in the second half of this year. The new government's advisory committee has begun to shape a framework on policies for the financial sector. Authorities are also keeping a close eye on the deliberations as hefty changes could be on the horizon. Our Eunice Kim explains. One of the hottest issues in the financial sector right now is the performance-based pay scheme. Controversial from the start, eyes are now on whether the new government will move to scrap it. There are at least nine state-run financial institutions that have introduced the pay-for-performance scheme this year. Of the overall 119 public agencies and state-run corporations that introduced the plan, 40% did so without the approval of unions, heading straight to the board of directors. The 
In fact, the Presidential Advisory Committee for State Affairs announced last week it would review a plan to scrap the system that has yet to be implemented in many commercial banks. Add to that another hot potato issue, separating finance and industry. For advancements in fintech, as exemplified in Korea's inaugural internet-only bank, many believe the policy that separates finance and industry needs to be eased. But the Moon government is known to hold fast to the tenant in the interest of keeping family-run conglomerates, or chebars, from further solidifying their wealth. The problem of a shrinking job pool as banks digitalize and the ballooning $1.2 trillion household debt pile, these are all outstanding issues that will require the attention of the next financial regulator. The banking system has many stakeholders, so the next head regulator will need to be able to fully understand and coordinate these various opinions in order to gain traction for a solution. Further, there are talks to reform the regulators themselves, such as decentralizing financial policy and supervisory functions within the Financial Services Commission and the strengthening of consumer protection under the Financial Supervisory Service. Leading many to believe there could be some major changes on the horizon as a new government settles in. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. The joint factory park in Kaesong was a symbol of inter-Korean economic cooperation that gave hope of peace and the possibility of unification. And when it was forced to shut down last year, it put many South Korean firms at risk. But the Moon Jae-in administration is stepping in to provide additional compensation to affected businesses. Our Lee Ji-young reports. The South Korean government is seeking to provide additional compensation for companies hurt by the suspension of the inner Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex. An unnamed official from Seoul's Unification Ministry said the ministry submitted its plans to the Presidential State Affairs Planning Advisory Committee, saying it will provide additional compensation and help to normalize business at the affected firms. After closing down the complex in February last year under the Park Geun-hye administration, the government provided roughly 454 million U.S. dollars to the South Korean companies with business there. That amounted to about 72.5 percent of the estimated damage of the 626 million dollars. But the firms have been asking for more because it was government policy that caused trouble for their business. At the time, the Unification Ministry was unable to secure more money from the authorities, but the atmosphere has changed under the new Moon Jae-in administration. The Unification Ministry first plans to compensate losses in subsidiary materials and complete products and then move on to investment assets like land, factories and machines. If the government pushes for full compensation, it will cost nearly 170 million U.S. dollars. The government official said the authorities are considering compensation for all damages that can be confirmed through documentation, but a unification ministry official cautioned that the details and scale of the compensation are not yet finalized. Another factor is voices in the government saying more compensation is neither possible nor appropriate, so the size of the compensation to come is still an open question. The Unification Ministry is also looking at compensating businesses hurt by the suspension of tours to Kumgangsang Mountain in North Korea nearly a decade ago and the so-called May 24th measure. On May 24, 2010, Seoul imposed sanctions banning inter-Korean exchanges to punish Pyongyang for the torpedoing of a South Korean warship. Lee ju -yong, Business Daily. Despite higher crude prices in the first quarter, Korea's consumption and exports of petroleum products grew. According to the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, Korea exported $8.7 billion worth of petroleum products, making it the third largest export item. Now that's four notches off from last year's first quarter. Petroleum product imports fell 4.2 percent to 78 million barrels, but consumption rose to 235 million barrels, 1.4 percent higher on year. Strong performance by the petrochemicals industry drove the growing demand for petroleum products. 
Despite frictions with China over Korea's THAAD deployment, exports increased 2.6 percent, with a 96 percent surge in diesel exports due to government requirements for low sulfur, sulfur diesel. With China's travel restrictions on group tours to Korea, the number of airline passengers between the two countries dropped by 47 percent to 897,000. Despite this increase, decrease, airlines saw a 3.8 percent increase for April travel on year. An increase in passengers on domestic routes to Jeju Island, combined with trips from Japan and Southeast Asia, pushed overall passenger traffic up to 8.68 million. Domestic low-cost carriers continue to thrive, with 47.1 percent more passengers compared to the same time last year. As an emergency measure, the Transport Ministry had allowed Korean carriers to launch new routes from Jeju Airport to fill the slots Chinese carriers abandoned. While the ministry doesn't foresee passengers from China increasing this month, overall passenger growth is expected to increase with the continued diversification of routes. The number of registered electric vehicles here in Korea has surpassed 13,800 units as of the end of last month, according to the Transport Ministry as well as the nonprofit Korea Automobile Manufacturers Association. Among the 13 different EV models, the most popular was Hyundai Motors Ioniq, accounting for more than 40 percent of all registered vehicles. It was followed by Kia Motors Seoul and Renault Samsung's SM3. An official from Hyundai Motor says the Ionic boasts high energy efficiency and that consumers can buy a model for less than 18,000 U.S. dollars with the aid of government subsidies worth $12,500 per unit. Now, with cross-country seat shortages on high-speed trains more common than ever, Corail is putting plans in place for new trains that should arrive in 2020. Our Elliot Kim has the story. With improved seating capacity and significantly more convenience equipment on board, new high-speed trains are expected to boost efficiency and help solve chronic seat shortages. Even consumer approval of the design is being taken seriously, with the model train being put on display at the station square before full-scale introduction three years from now. We are asking for public opinion on the design, and we plan on taking into account any good ideas we receive. Unlike conventional trains, these new high-speed trains don't require separate locomotives, and with each carriage having a separate power unit, all cars can now be passenger cars. Combined with the added length of 5 meters, the new trains are expected to have 75 percent more seats than the current ones. Passenger capacity is much better, and the center of gravity is lower, which helps improve stability. Advancements in comfort and efficiency are expected alongside this expansion in capacity. Seat pitch is estimated to increase 30 percent, and new amenities like individual windows and wireless phone chargers will be added as well. Right now it's a little narrow when riding with my child, but seeing the new trains, the seats look much more pleasant and spacious. Despite all the enhancements, the price remains similar to current trains at around $3 million per car, and CoRail plans to add 130 of them to improve train routes as well. The additions are expected to increase daily capacity by about 25,000 seats, which should help alleviate the chronic shortages around holidays. Elliot Kim, Business Daily. Gone are the days where passwords were all that were required for verification. In this day and age, our eyes and face add that extra layer of security with many other body parts with potential to serve that purpose. And our Oh Jung-hee takes a look at how far we've come and the road ahead. Paying for your groceries using your eyes, hands, or face, this might seem like something from the distant future. But with the world's information and communication technology developing to an ever higher level, state-of-the-art technology is already penetrating our daily lives. Just last week, Korea's retail giant Lotte Group opened an unmanned convenience store at Lotte World Tower in Seoul's eastern Jamsil area. Everything here is the same as in regular convenience stores, except that the customers themselves make payments possible. And that's not with cash nor credit card. 
This is the new hand pay system and it makes paying as simple as can be. Just put your palm onto the laser scanner. It scans your veins and sends the payment through. After customers place their items on the counter, a scanner reads the barcodes and the total price appears. Customers type in their cell phone number and have their palms read by another scanner. Payment completed. In other stores, I have to spend time getting out my cash or credit card to pay, but here I can just do everything by myself, even the payment, just with my palm. It's much quicker and more convenient. This is the first offline store in the world that enables payment through vein authentication. Customers first need to get their vein patterns registered and saved on the Lotte card server. These patterns are then linked to their credit card information. Customers' vein patterns are encrypted into a combination of letters and special characters. Then the data is dispersed into two separate servers. Only virtual codes are used for payments. All of this is done to protect people's biological information. Banks in Korea are also turning to the use of iris scanning for their clients' self-verification on mobile apps. In case of Shinan Bank, iris scanning is used for simple logins or personal authentication certificates. The user's iris data is kept in a storage area on the smartphone's software, making a data leak almost impossible. We had to find a method that is well suited for mobile banking. Some recent smartphones are equipped with small size iris scanning cameras, and users just need to look at the screen for scanning. We use only verification codes for authentication, so have no access to the iris data itself. Korea's biometrics market has grown by almost 20 percent every year to hit over 400 million U.S. dollars in 2018. While biometrics can be used in diverse sectors ranging from finance to healthcare and crime investigation, banks and card firms are most active in adopting this technology in order to keep up with market trends. Since two years ago, some smartphone apps have enabled fingerprint identification. Now apps have evolved to make use of the iris, vein patterns, and even DNA information. This is because conventional methods of self-verification contain the possibility of error, which can be lowered through biometric authentication. After all, in financial transactions, proving one's identity is key. Biological information is different for everybody and therefore belongs to only one person in the world. But that's also what could potentially cause an irreversible disaster. If the data gets hacked, all dimensions of a person's private information is leaked as well. And unlike passwords, biological information can't be changed. Of course, institutions try to guarantee maximum security for their clients' bioinformation saved either on individual smartphones or on a common server. But if a hacking disaster happens, a massive leak of private information could occur for those who have their bioinfo saved on a common server. So the U.S. government recommends people to use both biometric identification and passwords. Biometric authentication has risen as a reliable alternative to overcome the security weaknesses of passwords. But there are voices that claim the use of bioinformation isn't 100 percent secure itself. Measures for maximum security are required more than anything for people to be able to enjoy the coming era of biometric authentication without worry. Oh Jung-hee, Business Daily. And that wraps it up for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.